afternoon and welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, Director of Professional Development for the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, joined by my co-host, Ryan Lindsay, who is Assistant Dean for Social Work and also an Associate Professor of the Practice in our Social Work program. And this is actually our 36th Open Classroom program. I counted before we got rolling. We've been doing this since late March when the pandemic caused us to have to close our physical building to events like this. And we've been gathering in this virtual space uh, for new ideas, a little bit of professional development. And regardless of your connection to the university and the school previously, um, just a little bit of community. So welcome, uh, whoever you are and wherever you are, we are delighted you're here. We cannot see you or hear you, um, we, but we do love to hear from you. So your video and audio are both muted, but the chat function is enabled and you're able to send in your questions, your comments, self-introductions via the chat function. Um, so before we get rolling today, I just wanna offer some program notes. If I thought this week had been busy in open classroom, um, next week is even busier. So I just wanna briefly let you know about four programs that are available for registration next week. And it's all the same registration link. I'll throw it in chat in just a second. But it does actually give you a little bit of an idea of the range of programs that we have at the Brown School. So we have a program on Tuesday related to pandemic-related stress and trauma delivered by Dr. Megan Keyes. Um, later that afternoon on Tuesday, we'll be continuing our COVID-19 and race series with a panel on youth voices and youth power. So that's a bunch of community activists that are ages 15 to 21, hearing directly from them. On Wednesday, we'll be continuing our uh, programs on Medicaid expansion called Supporting a Healthier Missouri. And that program will specifically speak to the needs of rural communities and the impact of Medicaid expansion on them. And then finally, on Thursday, we are partnering with the Grand Challenges for Social Work on a webinar, Making Change, Messaging Your Issue for Policy Audiences. Um, so that will be also interesting. No matter what you're interested in, we hope we have something for you coming up. Uh, so now it's my great uh, privilege to introduce my friend Chris Fry, who's today's presenter. Chris is a licensed clinical social worker, a therapist, author, an educator, and a perennial favorite among the people who teach professional development workshops for the Brown School. Among Chris's clinical interests are introversion and extroversion. He's also very interested in later career transitions and shifts, so I've had the privilege of working with him on both projects. This conversation today is rooted in a, a seminar that he developed and delivers for us called Understanding Introversion in an Extroverted World. And that makes him just the guy to process this moment for us and with us. Welcoming Chris Fry speaking to us today about introversion and extroversion in social distancing and quarantining, impact and coping. Please welcome Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you all today. Um, I, it, as Janet mentioned, this is a topic I've been interested in for a long time, apply in my professional and my personal life uh, with as a clinician and with friends and family. And I really believe that it has some uh, incredibly important, uh, interesting and even enjoyable applications to what's happening with, uh, with the COVID situation. In spite of the fact that I'm a self-identified introvert, I wish that I was with you live uh, and could see each of your faces and interact with you and hear your questions, but uh, this is the best we can do. I think, it, I think it'll be a successful way to, to have some interesting discussion. Uh, I, am, I do what, if, if some of you are interested in further reading, you'd be interested in the work of Brian Little who talks about introverts who practice extroverted roles. So we, I, I love to present, I love to be in front of people and with people and engage with people and then I'll need to uh, go later after, after we've done this interaction, I'll need to go off and read a book or play my guitar or walk by myself outside to refill my tank as an introvert. And that really is a good place to begin in understanding this process. Um, in relation to COVID in particular, uh, it, part of what's interesting to me in un better understanding introversion and extroversion is that we are all learning how to cope with this situation 
as many of us are helping other people learn how to cope with this situation. So it's, it's pretty unique in that um, at the very best, I'm one step ahead often of folks in my clinical work as I'm learning and figuring and helping them out. And sometimes we're in exactly the same place. Damien Barr, a, a writer in England, you can see in your quote says, uh, in relation to COVID, we're in different boats, but we're all in the same storm. So although we have unique situations, we all have this common experience that we're challenged by and struggling with personally and professionally. I, I also put a quote of my own because I really believe it it's specific to the sheltering in place that many people have had to deal with in relation to introversion and extroversion. And that's that uh, one of the things I'm hearing from many people is how the pace of life, particularly folks in my age range who've been around the planet for a while, how this situation has slowed the pace of life and in some ways uh, made them move slower, sit still more, and you know, at times uh, in the best of ways be more present than the fast paced world that I think we live in most of the time. So as I've been preparing this, as I had the idea of trying to apply this topic particularly to COVID, part of what I did was uh, take some of the information that I'm familiar with and have used many times at, and then go into what, what was I seeing out there in the world that was being written? There's of course not much serious evidence being contributed yet, but there is a lot of writing in the popular literature around introversion and extroversion. Uh, and then also I decided to do my own kind of mini uh, non-standardized research. So I've interviewed a number of the introverts and extroverts in my own life to get their ideas about how they see themselves, how they're impacted by, by COVID, um, how they're coping with their situation, in particular related to introversion and extroversion. Very simple place to start. As you all checked in, most of you, it's pretty clear, are already aware uh, that you may be an introvert, an extrovert, or what is sometimes uh, kind of that balanced place in the middle, what what is called ambiversion in the literature. Like many other things that we experience and are aware of in terms of, of personality characteristics, this is a continuum. Some of us are, I consider myself mildly to moderately introverted. Some folks will consider themselves very extroverted. Uh, folks who are am ambiverts really identify as being able to function well in kind of both sides of the spectrum and that both sides really meet their needs. So it's, it's helpful to see it as um, graduations of this personality trait. And it's really important to see extroversion and uh, extroversion, ambiversion and introversion as a personality trait. It's not a dysfunction. It's n this is not a disorder. Uh, we were speaking in the soft opening and and Ryan was mentioning, it really is a, a part of who we are. It is not something that's right, wrong, better, good. Um, the reason that I originally developed the first workshop was though that we live in general in a very extroverted culture that has a high level of value for extroversion and social engagement. So many of you who are introverts out there that I'm speaking to today may have gone through periods of time where you have felt less than or, or experienced a message that you were somehow not social enough or not engaged enough in the world and taken that on in, in some way that you feel less than. We'll talk about that more and perhaps uh, you'll have some questions about that. There are lots of ways to understand extroversion and introversion. There are a number of characteristics that often go with each. The simplest and I believe most helpful way to understand it is that it really is about how we expend and replenish our energy. So introverts in general, those of you who are introverts in general, feel like you have expended energy through interaction, social contact, relational experiences with, with others, 
and that you need to step back and go into solitude and solitary activities to refill your emotional and mental tank. Extroverts are, um, are fed by ex expending energy in interaction and social engagement. And so a real simple example I like to use is that an uh, introvert might come to session and say, you know, I've been in meetings, Zoom meetings all week. I've been engaged with people all week. I'm staring into this screen and we're making eye contact all the time. I have to get away and read and work in my garden and play my piccolo and ride my bicycle by myself. Whereas if an extrovert uh, that I'm working with <coughs> connects up says, geez, I've been at my computer so much this week. I've been writing reports. I've been writing a new workshop. I have to get connected. I have to get out of the house. I have to make some contact with people. I have to have some conversation. I have to have some experiences that that give me more interaction. So it really is very much an ener I think the easiest and best way to think about it is it's an energetic issue in how we expend and feel replenished in our energy. Amberverts will say that they operate very well in both ways. That and you may some of you may experience this that there are times when solitude is just what you need. And there are times when a heightened level of interaction is just what you need. And you feel like you can kind of flex between the two with relative ease. So one of the interesting things that in the reading that I've done and in what I'm hearing from folks about COVID is that initially the message was kind of, um, there was a lot of negativity in some of the messaging that I was hearing, kind of like, in an introvert's articles uh, and introvert stamp stances kind of saying, oh, extroverts, now you're in our territory. You know, we're, we're in introverts paradise. We'll be able to shelter in place and have less contact and less interaction, less activity. And you, you extroverts are going to be um, kind of experiencing the depths of despair that we won't have. And so, uh, I gave you a couple of cartoons that that really amplify that. Um, some a cartoon I found early on in this work on the left, extrovert, let me out of here, introvert, quiet, feeling good. The, um, there is some truth to this. In the second cartoon, there's some truth to the extro extroverts feeling somewhat more isolated if they aren't in contact with people and some truth to introverts enjoying the opportunity to be uh, more internal and more in solitude. However, one of the shifts I've been seeing, because again, I'm learning this as I'm experiencing it, is that we've shifted in the situation with the virus, I believe we've shifted what I'm calling, we've shifted from the acute to the ongoing. And so as time goes on, I'm hearing more and more creative ways that both extroverts and introverts are trying to cope. And I'm hearing more and more of the introverts in both my professional and personal life saying, yeah, this was okay for a while, Chris, but this is too much for me. Uh, and so as this becomes an ongoing piece of a lot of our lives, I believe that we're gonna have to keep developing new and different strategies. Uh, and here's some ideas of how to see ourselves that will maybe give us a starting place. These are some of the myths and strengths of extroversion and introversion that I believe have real applicability in COVID. One of the myths is that introverts don't like people. I love people. I've devoted decades to being in a people profession. I love presenting. I love doing therapy. I love interaction. I, as an introvert, I like people. I like them in smaller groups and sometimes in smaller doses. And I struggle more with um, informal situations. I, if, if we were at a conference today all together, I would love presenting to you. I would love your questions. I would love you coming up to me afterwards and talking to me. And I would absolutely not want to go to the social hour afterwards 
and try to make casual conversation. I may force myself to do that if I'm a presenter, but at some point I'm gonna have to get away and refill because that's not where I find myself uh, having the most fun or engagement. The other myth is that um, it, extroverts do like people. Uh, extroverts, if you're an extrovert, you may like people a lot. You may not. There are cynical introverts and cynical extroverts. There, um, you may like engagement. You may like conversation. You may like connection. That may or may not mean that you truly like people in general. So it kind of dislodges one of those misconceptions. A second is that introverts don't want social connection and extroverts can't get enough. If we know that this is a continuum, then we know that in lots of introverts enjoy social connection a great deal, perhaps in smaller doses, perhaps with smaller groups of people, and with a greater need to step away and do solitary activities to replenish. Whereas there are also extroverts who, all, as much as you may enjoy social engagement and experiences, you may also need and take time for you. I have a very a close extroverted friend who meditates twice a day and is an artist and spends significant amounts of time alone creating art. Now, when he reaches out, we're gonna have extensive conversations for a pretty long period of time. One of the jokes he and I have is that I shouldn't call him when I've got five minutes to talk. Um, that's not going to be adequate. So it is also a myth that extroverts must have constant engagement. Some of you need more, some of you need less. Thirdly, um, and very related, the idea that extroverts can't ever co cope with quiet or alone time. Some of you have solitary activities. Some of you need time away also. You prefer engagement. Uh, or that introverts don't get lonely. I had a great conversation, or I witnessed a great conversation between an extrovert I know well and an introvert I know well. The extroverts, the introvert lives by themselves. And uh, the extrovert said, don't you ever get lonely? The introvert said, well, yeah, duh. Um, however, loneliness is part of my life experience. And so one of the things that some of you as introverts know that's a real strength is that experiencing periods of loneliness can be part of being human. You don't necessarily identify it as a bad thing that should never occur. It's another emotional experience that if we learn to be in it and inhabit it and let it flow through this, we can get better at it and cope with it when it's necessary. Folks who who have not had any of that experience are truly struggling with COVID. Folks who reject any sense of calm within loneliness or, or have not had the opportunity or taken the opportunity to learn to experience at least brief periods of loneliness and allow themselves to come out on the other side in a good place are truly being negatively impacted by a lot of the sheltering and disconnection that's been happening. Um, another myth is that extroverts only meet their needs through contact with others. Many extroverts have many interests. I would also say that one of the things I got that I was not as aware of, but I got from doing my own little research project with, with uh, friends and family and colleagues was extroverts who talked to me about the value of having not just contact with people, have it creating experiences. So something to plan, something to look ahead toward, the anticipation of a social experience, the anticipation of being out and about, and then the pleasure of actually being in that interact, those interactions, and then the memory of having experienced that, being able to keep that with them. And I have a term called emotional Velcro and what I mean by that is, um, if I have enough emotional Velcro, if I've had a wonderful social experience with you, if I have good emotional Velcro, it sticks with me for a while. So 
tomorrow I may not need another one. Some of it is with me. Three days from now, four days from now, a week from now, I may require more connection. However, I get to keep those memories and those experiences, not just up here, but in my whole body. That's what I call emotional Velcro. Part of that myth is that introverts only meet their needs through solitude. And in fact, a lot of us, again, like lots of kinds of experiences, including social experiences. And one of the greatest myths that I think has some possible real applicability in COVID is that extroverts are happy because they're outgoing and introverts are not happy because they are internal. There are happy extroverts and unhappy extroverts. There are happy introverts, unhappy introverts. It really depends on, in large part, am I living in integrity with who I am in this way? Am I bringing enough social engagement and enough connection into my life? And am I able to live in rhythm with what works best for me? And that's something that has been significantly disrupted by the virus for many, many people. So here are specifically some of the impacts and challenges that I think apply to this personality characteristic. And these will all be familiar to you. You've thought about them, you've read about them, you've heard about them on TV, you've probably talked with people about them. The level of isolation and how it affects different people differently one of the things I pay close attention to as a clinician is language. And it's interesting to me when I listen to the news, they often say um, solid, they mix solitude and isolation. And when I am working with folks who are introverted and also very much so when I'm working with folks who are dealing with depression, I, I help them to find the difference between solitude and isolation. They are not the same. Solitude gives us the opportunity opportunity to experience quiet and activity in quiet and silence in a way that can refill us and rejuvenate us. Isolation is painful, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Um, it's very much an issue with, with depression where folks will feel like they need to get away and replenish, except they're really isolating. And the more solitude they have, the worse they feel. You will know uh, so this is my first hint to you as an extrovert or an introvert. You will know if solitude is working for you because after you've had a period of it, you feel better. If you are having significant periods of solitude and you feel neutral or worse after them, then that suggests, it may suggest you're not as introverted as you think you are, or it may suggest that you're simply, you've kind of cross that line from solitude into isolation, which is not helpful for any of us. We are introverted or extroverted, essentially social beings. Um, and, and again, these relationships, by the way, they may not only be with people, they may be with, uh, you know, I talk to myself and, uh, and when I had a dog, I often talked to my dog, uh, who seemed to agree with me most of the time, which was delightful. A second impact is the level of impact of inactivity. And I found an interesting thing is, again, we're switching from acute to what I call ongoing. Early on, I, I heard a lot of my extroverted and introverted clients being more physically active. And a lot of people have talked about this. I've talked about this with my wife, where we would, we would go for walks and all of a sudden you're seeing families out for walks that have lived in the neighborhood for years and you didn't know they had three children. Um, I'm seeing a, a movement towards some folks becoming more sedentary. And a, a, a client told me earlier today, a feeling a sense of malaise was the word, was the word that he used. And so a harder time kind of getting moving and getting up and getting going and being active. It seems to be increasing as this goes on and on. The anxiety of uncertainty is something you're all familiar with and has been coming up over and over and over again in relation to this crisis. Increases in relationship conflict. In an article I would recommend you all read, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, if you are in a primary relationship with a partner, if you are working with couples, 
I would encourage you to uh, find a small article in uh, Time Magazine online, March 27th uh, is the, is the issue. And it's, um, can my relationship survive the togetherness of the pandemic is the subtitle. And then it has 11 things that couples can do very practical, simple things that couples can do. Interestingly, it was, uh, the article is based on three couples being interviewed who are all famous couples therapists. So the Gottmans are, interviewed and uh, Harville Hendricks and I think Helen Hunt, his wife, and I can't remember the third couple, but um, not only the, I, this is not only the isolation in reference to introverts and extroverts. I'm introverted. I live with, with a strong extrovert. We have different experiences in how we expend energy and replenish energy, as I mentioned earlier. So that really needs to be in the conversation for families anyway. I believe in this time of uh, where things have slowed down and some of us are feeling more isolated, it needs to be in the conversation even more. I'll give you some more specific examples of that as, as we go further into the workshop. Another piece I'm hearing both from introverts and extroverts is Zoom fatigue. Uh, from extroverts, it I hear yeah, it's okay, but it's not the same. It's not really, uh, you know, I'm not in the room with this person. The, the, the lack of physical touch that some people are experiencing. I don't get to hug my friends, those kind of things. The, some Zoom fatigue where it's kind of a, a reasonable substitute, but there's disappointment and even some depression that it's just not quite there. With many of the introverts, uh, I hear what I have experienced at times, which is when I'm doing video health sessions with my clients, which I've been doing for some months, there's this intensity of visual contact. When I'm sitting in my office and someone's sharing with me, sometimes I'm looking up into the corner as I'm hearing them and processing through what they're sharing. In video, there's this tendency that we're making eye contact the whole time. So, uh, something to be aware of that can be draining in terms of the intensity of the contact for some folks. And another issue that a lot of us are probably aware of and maybe experiencing in our own lives and with, with our clients are certain risk behaviors. Um, I'm interested in, and I, I'm guessing there will be some data on this, I'm interested in the data uh, about as folks are taking more physical risks and are going out more and putting themselves at risk for the virus, I'm interested in reading a study about the how many of those folks are introverts and how many of those folks are extroverts. So I, I'm guessing that there is a certain there are a certain number of extroverts who are more willing to put themselves at more risk because of that deep desire and need for more active social engagement. I don't know if that's true. I find myself uh, wondering that. Um, so I'd like to introduce just kind of an overall model, kind of a general model of some ways to pay attention to self-care during COVID, be you an introvert or an extrovert. And I've come up with four ideas that really I've adapted and, and brought together from, from several different models and, and people I've read and, and listened to. One of the things that is coming up a lot and I think is, is critical is movement. So we feel better in movement, whether you're introverted or extroverted, being physically active is really essential during this time. How you do that may be affected by your introversion or extroversion. If, if COVID were not going on right now and we were all in a room together, I would be saying, you know, how many of you bicycle? Raise your hands. How many of you run? Raise your hands. Now, um, okay. Now of those of you who bicycle, how many of you bike alone and how many of you would like to go to the Wednesday night biking group at the bike shop close to your house? And if you bike alone, 
are you introverted? If you bike with other people, are you extroverted? Generally, the extroverts are more likely to bike with other people. Introverts are more likely to bike alone. Biking is one of the few athletic activities you can do and socialize at the same time. If you're a runner, how many of you run alone? How many of you run in runners groups? And are you introverted or are you extroverted? Typically, uh, in my little informal study in workshops, more of the introverts run alone and more of the extroverts, at least part of the time, you know, show up on Main Street to meet those seven other people that run every Thursday night. Uh, so how you do that can fit very well with this, this part of who you are, how it helps you and replenishes you. Uh, one of the introverts I work with was telling me recently that he runs alone, which is okay, but he finds as he, that he also tends to ruminate when he runs alone. So it's not really the distraction he needs. He needs other activities that will engage him and help him um, free up his brain time from all the worries that COVID have, have brought into his life. So again, one's not white, right or wrong. How do you feature that in your life? Uh, my wife and I bicycle, and it's it's an interesting thing that as an extrovert, we can, and an introvert, we can talk part of the time, and then we can separate and go off on our own part of the time. And as I bike ahead, sometimes I'm kind of in my body as an introvert and aware of my internal experience biking and how I'm enjoying that. And then I watch her when she goes ahead of me, and she's kind of taken in the whole experience and the whole world around her um, as she goes. So same activity, meaning different needs in different ways. A second part of this is engagement. So be you extrovert or introvert, creativity is a key right now. How will you bec become and stay engaged with people in experiences with other living beings? Um, it, a good friend of mine who's an extrovert has been talking with me a lot about substitutions. And so his encouragement to other extroverts is look for reasonable substitutions for the kind of contact and connection you would prefer rather than putting yourself at risk. So one of the things uh, he's done is, uh, is deliver care packages to people he knows and then he speaks to them through the door and has a certain amount of safe social engagement and an active service. Third piece is, if solitude is hard for, you, if hard for you, get better at it. Ernie Larson, one of my favorite writers used to say, uh, favorite therapist, a very famous guy, used to say, well, people would come to him with whatever struggle that they were having and he would say, well, I guess that's something you're gonna need to work on. So if solitude is hard for you, there are ways to get better at it, whether it's through mindfulness, whether it's through mindfulness meditation, whether it's through breath work, whether it's through finding act, uh, some solitary activities that you find rewarding and positive. If you have a tendency to move from solitude to isolation, push yourself. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and then the fourth is mastery. One of the things we hear so much about is this uncertainty that we're struggling with. So we need to find out where we do feel strength in a sense of mastery. I saw a great email from a treatment center called uh, Sierra Tucson. And from a 12 step perspective, they said, make a list, here's a simple exercise, make a list of what you are still in control of, or at least have mastery of and choice in during this COVID crisis, and then make a list of what you need to accept and practice letting go of. It's really a, a variation of the serenity prayer. Where, do, where can I best put my energy and what do I need to let go of? To give us some sense uh, beyond, this is such an uncertain time, we have no idea what will happen. I do know what I can learn and how I can practice taking care of myself in this time. 
So from that general perspective, I'd like to give you a more, a few more specific ideas of, uh, of some ways to cope with sh shelter in place and uh, social distancing, then talk just a little bit about partners and parents before I take questions. Uh, these are some things that I think most of you will go, oh, that makes sense. Not really necessarily revolutionary, but I hope you'll see them as significant in, in relation to one another. It's essential that we stay and encourage the people that we're close to to stay physically active. This does not necessarily mean athletic. I like to say when I was young and I called it play, I wanted to do it all the time. And then I started to call it working out and it got harder. So uh, what, what helps you stay in movement and in your body so that we're not just in our heads? A second piece is to allow that to be outdoors. Uh, what some of us like to call being in nature. So be in experiences where you are connected with the sensory world beyond yourself because COVID is driving us inside of ourselves deeper and deeper and deeper. It has that potential. And so what takes us a bit outside of ourselves is to have sensory experiences. Outdoors you are, if I were Outdoors right now, I would feel the heat on my face. I would feel the breeze in my hair. I would feel the sweat on my brow. I would feel the movement of my body. I could smell the, the green. It takes me up and out and energizes me. A third piece is what I like to call kinesthetic or hands-on activities. What are things that you're doing that again, our sensory experiences. I, I've heard a lot of people talk about doing more cooking and feeling the ingredients and smelling the ingredients and experiencing the process. So what are things that actually kind of, again, engage us from a sensory place? Um, the next piece, it comes from, if you are not familiar with Neil Game and he's a very unique and interesting, famous writer, if you get the chance, watch a 20 minute YouTube video that of Neil Gaiman speaking some years ago at Oxford at their graduation ceremony. And it's wonderful. Um, his, the title is Make Good Art. And he, he's essentially saying, no matter what's going on in your life, positive, negative, or somewhere in between, make good art of it. So part of what I am trying to do myself and encouraging those around me and my clients to do is create something. What are you currently creating? Because COVID is, I believe, a creativity robber. It's, it's, there's a lot of kind of groundhog day to it. And so what are, what are you good at? What is creative for you? You may write, you may do music, you may paint, you may refinish furniture, you may garden. You may sew masks. Um, uh, a, the friend of mine who's an artist, his wife is a seamstress. They somehow took some of his art and have superimposed it on masks that she sewed. So uh, tap into creativity. For you as an introvert, you may do that, a lot of that in solitude. For you as an extrovert, you may be in some creative venture uh, some of the more outgoing clients of mine are doing a lot of gaming in groups and uh, in making that a social uh, and a creative experience. Uh, some of the role play games that are way more complex that I don't understand that are very engaging and creative. Take time to meditate and relax. And if you are not met a meditator in the formal way, pull up a medication, meditation app like headspace, or simply learn to breathe 10 times and then repeat. And if your mind drifts, come back to the first breath and repeat. Be of service, which again gets us out of ourselves and puts us in connection, but you can do that in a way that's congruent with who you are. So for me, this is it. For me, today is in part an act active service for me and it connects me with you it connects me in a way that's congruent with who i am not 
with something that isn't going to work for me and isn't going to fit with who I am. So my extroverted friend taking care packages to his friends is not only an act of service and caring, he's meeting his own needs because he gets to interact with people in a safe way. And stay curious. As this is ongoing, I think one of the risks is that we will stay more and more in the, oh, another day just like the other day. And for introverts, that can drive us more and more inside of ourselves. We become more and more sedentary, developing that malaise. For extroverts, it can, I believe, develop a greater sense of hopelessness and helplessness, that it's all the same. And when will I ever be able to connect again in the ways that, that I need to and most like to? Stay curious and creative about ways that that you can find for having the level of connection that you want. My wife and I were joking that I have this great relationship with myself. She didn't know how much I talked to myself until we were sheltering in place. And, uh, and it might be catching. I wonder if she'll start to talk to herself too. But I have this great, you know, internal dialogue that gets externalized when there's nobody around watching me. It's very helpful sometimes. Gregory Lance says to remind ourselves that social distancing is not the same as isolation. Social distancing is a safety issue. Isolation is a way of being, is an experience, is painful. And so what are some of the ways that we can counter that as introverts and extroverts? Um, extroverts often talk to me again, as I mentioned before, about kind of the anticipation, the planning, the experience itself and what they carried out of the experience and keep with them for a while. So what you can look ahead to, what you can then experience and how you then come to have that experience. You may need to look at pictures of some of the trips you've taken. You may need to plan your next vacation even though you're not exactly sure when it will be. You may need to have some of those memory experiences that help you feel in relationship. Some of the uh, introverts that I've spoken to have felt a significant amount of relief. I was talking to a good, close friend of mine who's a psychologist and quite introverted who said, the absence of a constant schedule has been delightful. And the absence of the need to decide, gosh, this would be good for me, I should go to this party, but I don't really want to, but will I, but won't I, so some of that having to make fewer of those decisions has been a relief to her. The challenge has been she has to make sure to connect enough. And so that it, that's where we can kind of move into the quantity or quality of experiences. I've heard some extroverts tell me that they're having a lot of quantity of connection through social media, through Zoom, et cetera, et cetera, but it, it doesn't fill them up. And so stepping back and saying, what are the kind of connections and who are the kind of folks to connect with that are the most fulfilling, the most meaningful, the most replenishing is helpful, I think, for all of us introverts or extroverts right now. So distancing is not the same as disconnection, although it can feel that way at times. Um, I've already mentioned substitutes. Look for the best substitutes you can create that replenish you and re refill your tank. Watch out for the, it's not good enough, it's not what I really want, because that's a reality for lots of us right now. Look as much as you can toward what are the best and most reasonable, what could be good enough and helpful, as opposed to an either or. Um, and I, I adapt, the next piece is I adapted a, a term um, from grief work, dosing. When we do grief work, we can go in and out of grief and we need to step out of it at times. Dosing, the way I'm using this is what uh, my sister, who is a psychologist, calls, calls um, small connections. I, I've begun to call micro connections. She says that she can put a mask on and go to the grocery store and say hi to some people she doesn't even know as an introvert 
and feel pretty good for the day. She didn't necessarily need to have a lot of engagement. And so step into it and step out of it and step into it and step out of it. The last piece of social stress, the social stretch is something that relates to relationships um, oftentimes in our house. So I wanna speak a little more specifically to partners and parenting for a moment before I turn it over to questions. So here are some relationship tips for introverts and extroverts in COVID. Talk about introversion and extroversion with the partners and other people in your house and in your family. It's, they're really interesting conversations and they can open up um, kind of acceptance and engagement. In general, the message to lots of children is that it, in our systems around the country is that extroversion is the better way to be. And many introverted kids um, are hurt by that or experience pain around that. Uh, Susan Cain's second book, Quiet Power, is a great book if you're a parent uh, to, to read because she talks more specifically about parenting introverted kids. Learn about and value introversion and extroversion. So if we agree that one is not better or worse, good or bad, then they all have value, they all have strengths and, and, and they all have challenges and limitations. Uh, be aware of the need for connection and solitude as a parent and a partner. Both are necessary for all of us, whoever we are. And we're, we, for many of us who live in households with other people, we've been pushed together. If you live alone, as many people do, that's a different challenge of how you will fit partnership and connection into your life. Another tip is be aware of internal and external processing. Introverts often think and then share, and extroverts often think while they share. This is not always true, it's commonly true. Again, one is not bad or good, better or worse, but uh, we can be challenged by the other person's style. And as we're together more and more, those challenges are often amplified. Remembering that finally, that the goal is not for me to become an extrovert or my wife to become an introvert, it's for us to be able to understand it, uh, each other's experience. I don't have to live her language, I need to understand her language. She does not have to live my language, she needs to be more aware of my language and where I live from. So for introverts, be aware as you're thrust together with others of the potential of, for stress and anger when you feel overstimulated and over aroused by interaction. So one way introverts can stop the interaction is, I can't seem to make you stop talking to me unless I get angry and make you go away. So watch out. Don't, don't wait until you're on overload to create or ask for reasonable space. A famous, the second piece, a second, uh, a very famous thing that, that those of you who do couples work know, very old and famous is, if I'm the one who steps back because I needed to, then it's my responsibility to re-engage and step forward. Otherwise it becomes pursuer distancer. The introvert steps back, the extrovert comes forward, the introvert steps back, the extrovert comes forward, and now we're fighting over who loves who enough. Um, and so if I'm the introvert and I step back, when I have refilled my tank to some degree, it is my responsibility to step forward and re-engage and find my extrovert. And if you are going away, if you are one of those essential service people or someone who is going into work more and more now away from home, if you come home fatigued from interaction, remember if you have extroverted family members, they're probably not gonna say, why don't you take 20 minutes to go upstairs and catch your breath before we talk about our day. They like children, you know, they wanna meet you at the door and have engagement. So having a conversation about if you come home depleted from interaction and your extroverts don't have that experience, 
how you will re-engage with one another. For extroverts, remember that if folks, your introverts need quiet time, it doesn't mean they love you less or don't want to be connected to you. Remember that you can be in the same space and have connection and it does not have to be verbal. Remember that you can do what my wife calls teaching our introverted children, the fine art of conversation or what she used to call the learning the, the fine art of small talk, the value of small talk. A lot of introverts hate small talk. And if you are at home and an introverted member returns home depleted, it's okay to give them time to make the transition. I'm gonna take a break there and see what questions you have. I have a little more information if we need to fill some time, but I wanna hear what you have to say and what you need to hear about. Great. Chris, thank you so much. The chat has been fantastic while this presentation has been going on. Lots of connections, ideas, sharing. So I just, and many, many compliments as points that you've made um, have, have resonated with other folks. Um, I actually, we have, Plenty of questions and not enough time, which okay. is often the case, but there's a couple of housekeeping small things I wanted to ask you. Folks have had a desire for um, this presentation as like a, a, an, a, a PDF that they could have. Would you be okay with us sharing um, on the website? Absolutely. And there is a reading list at the end of the PowerPoint. So I'll give you some, some great readings to follow up on. And that's actually a beautiful segue to the second housekeeping question which was right at the beginning, you referenced a book and Ryan and I were both taking notes on other things and there was an interest in that citation. Do you remember what was that you- that the Susan Cain book, Quiet? Okay, I think probably, yes, thank you. Ryan, do you wanna take next question? Yeah, there was a, a question that came up um, about, um, let's see, a Angela wanted to know if uh, you find that introverts have any easier time with mindfulness skills than extroverts or how do, how do the two personality styles or ambiverts adding that in fit with mindfulness? Yeah, I think it that my belief is that mindfulness is in some ways more about how cluttered is my mind. And so although as an introvert, I find quiet easier than extroverts. I'm also as an introvert, I also ruminate more and and think about everything. So it, it very much depends on our ability to be okay with quiet, which is easier for introverts, and our willingness to and seeing the benefit of quieting our minds. So uh, it, I believe it can be in that way a bit easier for introverts, although again I have several extroverted friends who uh, meditate every day. And partly why they do that is to train themselves to quiet their minds because they are so social and verbal. Thanks. Um, another question was actually looking at generational differences between how people express introversion and extroversion. And are, there, are we seeing differences in how that's showing up? Well, I think that um, certainly technology and social media has changed introversion and extroversion. So uh, the, the, I'm sure there'll be more data coming out on that. But I believe that uh, younger folks are more naturally able oftentimes to engage in means other than direct face-to-face -face contact. I'm drawn to face-to-face -face contact. Video sessions with my clients are a reasonable substitute. I prefer to be in the room. So I believe that um, younger folks are probably more adaptable in that way. Although we see younger folks hungering for getting out into the world. So um, I, I've, one of the issues for the elderly is if they are not technologically conversant and many are not, they are hugely isolated right now, being not being able to have physical contact. So if you have elderly folks in your life, find creative ways to connect with them and reach out to them because many of them are just incredibly isolated right now. 
Yeah, and Julie put up a great question around um, how, how do genetics and how do environments um, interplay in the development and the expressions of introversion to the continuum of extroversion? It's a great question. Um, like so many things in our field, there's been this ongoing, you know, discussion about how much is nature, how much is nurture. And I believe that the general point of view in the data these days is that we are probably born with some kind of tendency toward introversion or extroversion. Um, socialization, though, has a real impact. And so as I get more comfortable and confident in the world, I can become more extroverted. Um, I, I clearly was born introverted. I moved around a lot and I, I developed what Brian Little called practiced extroversion and restorative niche. So I act extroverted much of the time and then I go away and restore myself as an introvert. So uh, I think the answer is that it really is a combination of both. I do hear as people age, I hear some of my extroverted friends say they're more comfortable with quiet and solitude than they used to be. And I see some introverted folks who get more social and more connected. So it doesn't seem to necessarily be static. So there's a couple questions and I want to try to bundle them. I um, want to defer them to you because you're the clinician. But we, we have a couple of questions that have come in through the chat, like can an extrovert be anxious in a social situation? And how would PTSD um, impact uh, introversion versus extroversion? So those are mental health concerns. And this is going to be our last question just due to time. But I'd love to have you comment on that. Yeah, I would point you toward Jonathan Cheek's work, C-H-E-E-K. Uh, -E -E He's a, a psychologist who has broken introversion into four different types. Um, it is a, it's a myth that, so, again, social anxiety, shyness, and introversion are the same. However, he identifies a kind of socially anxious type of introversion that, uh, that some folks experience. And if you look at that yourself, you'll probably be able to see your subcategory I, I'm what we call a thinking uh, introvert. In terms of PTSD, um, it's, it's a great question. I've not seen any data that, that associates introversion and extroversion with what if someone is also experiencing PTSD. My off the top of my head assumption would be that if I'm draw, if I am already naturally introverted, PTSD would have the heightened possibility of driving me further and further into myself and that being a risk factor. So connecting in healthy, refill, refilling, safe ways, you know, are very, that's a very important part of PTSD treatment anyway. It's a really interesting question I haven't thought about too much, but my guess is it might be a heightened risk for folks who were significantly introverted. Sounds good. So with that, we are nearly at time. This has been such a fantastic, rich conversation. I appreciate all that everybody's brought, but Chris, your leadership. Um, before we close out, do you have any final comments or thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? I would just point you to um, the, the PowerPoint will be posted and there's additional information on parenting introverts and extroverted children and a little bit on the Brian Little work that I mentioned and then a reading list. So there's there's some additional information if you wanna keep going deeper and deeper into the conversation with yourself and others. And that, thank, that, you. thank you for the time. Well, thank you for choosing to contribute in this way. Absolutely, this contribution of your time has been meaningful to hundreds of us, including myself. Um, so thank you for that. I wanna thank my wonderful co-host, Ryan, for being here fielding questions and all in the chat with you guys. Um, always a pleasure. Um, and before closing out, um, I'm noticing that in the chat towards the end, we do have specifically more questions related to trauma and um, the situation that we're living in. So there's a couple programs coming up that will be particularly of interest to uh, folks that are either interested in the topic or clinical. Uh, one of them is Tuesday's uh, open classroom with Dr. Megan Keyes on pandemic-related stress and trauma. 
And then there's another program in August, and I didn't check the date, but you will be able to find it on the website. Uh, Dr. Julie Masnack and Dr. Megan Keyes are teaming up, and theirs is specifically on PTSD. So if that's a part of this conversation you're interested in, we actually do have something coming up. Uh, so with that, all I can say is thank you all so much uh, for being a part of this experience. I wish everyone a good weekend and hope we'll see you with us uh, next week. And um, please stay healthy and safe. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you.